Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining with me today. It's a Pastor David Trainum coming into your heart, your life, your car, your home, as I always say, thanking you once again for tuning in and being with me. In a few moments, I'm going to uh, be getting into our second teaching that I've entitled Faith for the End Times. And as I began the series last week, I stated that God, you know, having faith and patience is not new. See, we, we saw this in the book of Genesis chapters one and two, and last week in the book of Peter, as God waits for the fulfillment of souls coming to repentance before he wraps things up in the earth. You see, it took faith for God to create the earth, and it also was taking faith for God at the end of this dispensation that we're currently in. And so we're going to be talking about those things as we unfold some truths, looking at what balanced faith, patience, and hope, and also love is all about for the children of God. Now, as we go, let's let's get right into the teaching. I've got a lot to share. I've got 100 pages of notes that I want to put into your hearing over the next uh, few weeks and months. And so it's going to take a little while, but I believe that your heart and your life is going to be impacted and your faith is going to become more solid as you not only hear what has to be said, but also become a doer of the word of God as God requires obedience on every level. And so let's look at this. You know, as we look at having faith for the end times, and we saw last week that, you know, God is not slack concerning his coming, but he is patient as he waits for all people to be saved, that's going to be saved. You see, people are skeptical today, just as they were when they waited for the promised Messiah 2,000 years ago. They discounted the prophecies that were sure, those prophecies that were certain. They discounted the prophecies that were definite, and they lived as if he were not coming. And when Jesus did come, they didn't even recognize him, just like many people in our day or in the, especially the time when Jesus does come, they're not even going to recognize the signs of the times. Because John chapter 1, as it refers to him, it says in verse 10 that he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Verse 11, it says, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You see, you must understand that God is not going to change his plan to accommodate the people who do not believe in him or his prophecies. He's awaiting the proper season, and he knows when all things are ready, and for us, we must always be ready by living right and consistently spreading his message of salvation and love to this lost and dying world. You see, the wise person understands that God operates by seeds, as we talked about that the, in the last series that we did on, on the last days and times. We talked about the importance of seasons or dispensations of time. And with our current dispensation being a season of grace. But the time is going to come when this season comes to an end. And we're going to be ushered into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Remember, we saw that. After this season, this thing that we call time as we know it will no longer be a factor. And we will enter our promised eternal heavenly state as time retracts and gives way to eternity, living in a new heaven and a new earth, wherein, as the Bible says, dwells righteousness. However, my friend, God is going to fulfill his plan and nobody can stop it. And similar to God fulfilling his plan to send his son, and when the time was fulfilled, nobody could stop it. The same is true for these end 
time prophecies and events that's going to happen. You see, concerning God fulfilling his plan to send his son, look at what it says in Galatians 4. It says in verse 4, but when the set time had fully come, the King James Version translates it when the fullness of the times had fully come. God sent his son, and literally in the Greek, he shot forth his son, get this, as an arrow with a specific target in mind. Born of a woman, born under the law, with the purpose of redeeming those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, in fulfillment of every prophetic word about Christ coming into the earth through Genesis chapter uh, 3 and verse 16, Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, the Psalms, and many other scriptures reveal the purpose of God or the time for those things to be fulfilled. And that purpose or the time for those things could not be stopped. My friend, so it is in our generation. As God said, time will fully come to pass. And my friend, it has come upon us. You see, this will not be the first time that God moved in the earth without the approval of kings, <laughs> without the approval of presidents, senators, bankers, educators, religious leaders, social activists, or the majority vote of the people. God is going to establish his will and his word, and he knows that they will best accomplish his purposes in the earth. And this is why Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 says, "There's uh, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And this includes a time for God to fulfill everything he has decreed. He's not moved by the impatience of mankind. He's not moved by the days, the weeks, the months, and the years that we operate by. And as we saw, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. God is God of seasons. And he moves you from one season into another. He changes seasons that were stormy in your life into seasons that are calm. Seasons of sickness into seasons of health. Seasons lived in lack into seasons of prosperity. Seasons of depression into seasons of freedom. And this same thing is true with every prophecy of the end times. God is moving us from one season, the dispensation of grace, to another season, the millennial reign of Christ. But before we can embrace the new season, the old season must be fulfilled in its entirety. You see, the world has aligned itself with the prophecies of the Bible. No one is going to stop the prophecies. No one is going to slow down the fulfillment of what God said. And because somebody does not believe what God said, it does not mean they will not happen. And I reiterate what I said previously, because it is very important. And if you don't get anything else about these end times truths, please know the end times will not be announced any more than they have already been announced. A trumpet is not going to sound to get the attention of the people of the world. And then God is going to say, now the end times will begin. Now you can start living right before Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. As simple as this might seem, it's not going to happen. I don't know what, especially the church, a lot of people who say that they're believers, I don't know what they're waiting for. Because there's not going to be any other sign given. Because God has given every sign he's going to give. And it's up to his people to recognize the times as they're happening. It's up to you individually to believe what God said so you can extend mercy and grace to this lost and dying world, specifically the people within your sphere of believing. Things, my friend, 
They've been lining up for centuries. And we in our generation have been living out some of the worst times the earth has ever seen. Yet things are going to get worse. And to, and to overcome them, you're going to need faith for the end times. You see, in our day, faith is often misunderstood. Please hear this. Because it's a kingdom concept, not a natural one. And what makes biblical faith difficult to determine is because most believers have no understanding of God's kingdom. <laughs> they say that the kingdom is a reality. They say they're part of the kingdom of God. And they say that the kingdom is, the kingdom is real, but they lack biblical knowledge about it. And it's this lack of knowledge that keeps them operating in a natural here at assumption rather than a biblical faith. Because most believers are not as mature as they should be, they utilize what they think is faith to get something from God instead of using it to live for God. And this causes a lack of focus and brings heartache and disappointment when what they thought they were extending faith for does not happen when they thought it should happen. And this disappointment in not receiving something from God often happens because people do not understand that being a kingdom citizen already has benefits that guarantees that your natural needs will be taken care of. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, the New Living Translation this time, in verse 28, when he says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And then in verse 30, he says, And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Verse 31, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Because in verse 32, it says, because these things dominate the thoughts, hear it, of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. So your responsibility is not to consume your mind with the same thoughts that people who don't even believe in God are filling their life with. What are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to uh, uh, live? What are we going to drink? Understand, you do everything you can to make your life as, as easy as possible, but you got to understand that God has already said, for especially you, that these things are going to be taken care of. And so he tells you to seek the kingdom of God, verse 33, Matthew 6, above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Verse 34, he says, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. You see, this is the principle of, you know, this is what I call it, the principle of kingdom sustenance. God is obligated to take care of these things for you as you do your part in seeking his kingdom above all else and living a righteous lifestyle. See, you cannot be a citizen of God's kingdom without the king of the kingdom providing for you as one of his subjects. Again, I encourage you. I did the teaching last summer, I believe it was. Go back. Look at that teaching on the kingdom of God and see just what God has provided for you. Because as we enter further into God's end time plan, you will see more people understanding that it's not what you can get with your faith that will demonstrate 
that God is operating in your life. It's how you trust God to fulfill what he already said he would do for you. And your responsibility is to carry out your kingdom assignment in the earth and allow God to manifest his promises in your life. This, my friend, is what trusting God is all about. I, I can't say it any other way. This is what trusting God is all about. Your responsibility is not to be a natural citizen that lives by your carnal thoughts. Because you're a spiritual being just as much as you're a natural being. And the, the thing is, what you've done is, however old you are, you spent all of, or I should say most of these years, learning how to navigate in this natural earth, but you spent very little time learning what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom or living a spiritual life. We know the terminology. We know that we're to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We know a lot of, if not all of, the spiritual vernacular. But what God is doing is he is saying that you must trust him every moment of every day. You see, in the natural, you trust people when you know that they will do what they promised. Isn't that true? It's been proven, especially when you go to work for somebody. They promise that they're going to pay you every Friday or every other Friday or whatever day of the week you get paid. And before they give you one penny, you've already worked for them a week or two, sometimes more. What's that? That's in the natural, trusting somebody to do what they promised. But in the same manner, through faith, you come to trust that God is going to do what he promised. And so what I'm endeavoring to do as this new year has unfolded and we've already put the month of January behind us, I want to give you greater understanding of biblical faith by sharing what faith is, how to live by faith, and God's purpose for giving you faith. And it's God's purpose for giving you faith. It's where I'm going to begin. Faith, my friend, if you go to Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 1. It's something that must grow. Because as a child of God, he has already given you faith. It took faith to come to God and receive his son as your personal savior. And therefore, you accept the fact that faith is in you. Now, the question becomes, how do you get your faith to grow? Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, and that word soberly means thoughtfully or rationally, as God has dealt, past tense, to each one a measure of faith. Verse 4, for we have many members in one body. There's a reason why I'm sharing this. It's important. But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being member, being many, I should say, are members of one body in Christ. And individually, we're members of one another. Now, you know, when you look at 
verse four, the first word there is four. And when it starts with four, it's saying that something preceded it that I'm building upon. We're going to look at that in a second, not spend a lot of time on it, but just to make certain that, that we understand this measure of faith. Now, as we look at what God causes the Apostle Paul to write here, you have a very important scripture sandwiched in between living right. Remember, verses one and two, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. We have this important scripture sandwiched between living right and serving right. And this is why he went into the fact that we have many members in one body. But all members don't have the same function. And individually, we are members of one another. You see, and so in living right and serving right or using your faith to benefit the greater body of Christ, Paul admonishes you to live holy and refrain from living according to the pattern of this world. And this is accomplished and can only be accomplished by renewing your mind and doing what is just and right in God's eyes and not live so you can win the approval of men. It's important for you to understand and know that living right is not an option for the people of God. And the only way you can live right it's not by wishing and hoping that you do, but it's by learning how God wants you to live. And then when you are presented with the opportunity to actually live right, you're going to make the right decision and do it. And it must be said up front that living to please God does not mean that you purposely Offend the people that come across your path every day. Your responsibility is to consistently be salt and light so you can be used by God to win them. And you never win people by purposely offending them, quote unquote, in the name of the Lord. And so the presenting of your body and the renewing of your mind are to be done simultaneously and consciously every day until you are living as God determines for you to live without even thinking about whether or not you're living the way God wants you to live all the time. In essence, you're to live the way that God, that pleases God unconsciously. And when you do, you're living the culture of the kingdom, not practicing the culture of the kingdom. You hear that? When you live in the way that pleases God unconsciously, you are living the culture of the kingdom, not practicing the culture of the kingdom. Uh, a lot of times, we confuse a few acts of practicing what God wants us to do with actually living how God wants, we, uh, wants us to live. And you look at your life and, you, and where you are as a gift of God. And you compare what you do with the Bible so you can clearly see the areas you need improvement in. This causes consistent maturity. You improve your life even when you feel you may have attained a state of maturity that you can stay on. See, this, this is where I believe many believers miss it. They progress when they first get saved. God gave them that measure of faith. They're excited about their new walk with God. They're studying. They're going to Bible study. They're doing the things that's needed. They're, they're studying to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. They're doing everything they can to improve their life until they get to a certain level of maturity. 
and then they think that they can stay there. But if you compare how you are living to other people and think that because you are further along than they are, you will never attain the standard that God has set for you personally. You're going to give the account in account for how you lived, for what you did with what God gave you. And to whom much is given, much is required. And so we can never camp out on, you know, uh, on where we're at. We must consistently move our lives forward. And so no matter what level you think your faith is on, you are not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Just can't do it. Why? Because you will always find somebody who's struggling in an area that you have overcome. See, it's just a matter of time before you begin to see people for who they are. In church, we see everybody oftentimes, most of the times, 90% of the time, maybe even more, at their best behavior, because some people don't care. Some people will go to church, they will be in the presence of other believers, and they'll still act their same worldly ways. But most people, they're going to put their best foot forward. And sooner or later, you're going to see them slip. And I don't care what position they have in the church. They can be a member of the church, a servant in the church, a pastor or a leader in the church. Nobody's exempt. And I'm putting myself in there. Nobody's exempt because nobody's perfect. And so you're always going to find someone who is struggling in an area that you have overcome. And if you become haughty and proud, you do this at the expense of not seeing the log in your own eye because God is not comparing you to other people. He's comparing you to the standard that Jesus Christ set for you to live by and living in full obedience to the Father. You must live every day knowing that God wants you to improve on the shortcomings, hear this part though, and the successes that you made yesterday. Every day provides you with the opportunity to be more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You do this gradually by making up your mind to live by faith. And living by faith is more than learning what the Bible says about faith. Having faith is more than telling somebody that you have it. Faith, my friend, is revealed in the attitude you have in the midst of the trials that you go through. And this is where many people fail the faith test. You see, the faith that you have is not something that you create and develop by learning more about how it operates. Because to advance your faith, it must be put in proper perspective. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, as we know. But faith stays by applying what God told you to do and trusting him when faced with contradictory circumstances. The faith that you have was given to you as a gift from God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, as we just read, it says that God has dealt to every one of us a measure of faith. And this measure of faith was enough to give you access to the kingdom of God. However, from there, it must grow if it's going to benefit you for the long haul. You must learn how faith grows. You must water the seeds of faith so you can withstand the challenges of maturing in Christ. And God, he intends for you to grow in your relationship with him just as you grow in age 
while going through the earth in the natural. Because growing in your faith, it's going to produce a holy and righteous life. Growing in your faith, it's going to affect your character. And for you to live holy and righteously, God gave you an element of faith as a gift. And his intention is that you would use what he gave you to make the body of Christ better. Remember, I said that this gift was given so that you can live right and you could serve right. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul shares what is referred to as gifts of grace. Although given to you as a gift, you must operate the faith that God gave you because this faith activates the gifts of grace. It says in verse 6, Romans 12, it says, having then gifts differing, because everybody's got a different gift, according to the grace that is given us, it says, let us use them. And so every person in the body has an area that they excel in to make the world around them better. And this happens as you operate in your gift of grace by faith. Because God did not give you faith to flaunt it before others. And being gifts of grace and a gift of faith reveals that you are responsible to use what God gave you in the manner that he determines for you to use it. I'll say it again. Being gifts of grace and gift of faith. It reveals that you are responsible to use what God gave you in the manner he determines for you to use it. Why? Because they're gifts. Yes, they're yours. But the maturing of those gifts, the gift of grace and the gift of faith, reveals that you are responsible and they come with a responsibility. And God gave them to you so you can serve the, the greater body of Christ. I'll say it this way, do it in the right way. And what you've got to do is understand that your gift may be different than someone else's, but it is not better than their gift, and neither is it less than their gift. Why? Because as I said, you're going to give an account to God for how you use what he gave you. Not what he, not what you try to copy somebody else doing. God gave you the measure of faith to get saved. He also gave you a gift or gifts that are to be used to make other people better. However, you must identify your gift and use it as God wants it to be used. The gift is often, but not always, an area of passion that you have. Because I've heard so many people ask me that question over the years. How do I know my gift? It's often, but not always, an area of passion. And you take that passion and you look for ways to serve other people. And in doing so, if you see areas that we are living in that's not representing kingdom principles and how God wants things to be done, you do what you can to influence those areas. Now, the Bible reveals that there are several types of faith. You see, some people, they have referred to these types of faith as levels of faith, but they're not levels to be attained. They're types, they're forms or varieties of faith that reveal the state that somebody is in at any particular point in time. And the reality is you can be strong in faith one day and because of circumstances that you feel are beyond your control, you run in fear. 
Didn't Elijah do this when he was when he confronted the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the false god Asherah? And then what's he do? He runs from Jezebel. He took his eyes off God and what God told him and let the words of a person dictate his reaction. And so you can be strong in one area one day and yet weak in that same area another day. So I'm only saying this because I want you to understand that these things that I'm going to be sharing next week are not levels of faith. They're types of faith. And in the same manner, you can also be strong in one area of life, yet struggle in your faith in another area of life. Some people are strong when it comes to believing God for their finances, but they need faith to be strengthened when it comes to God keeping them in health or bringing healing to their bodies. And the more you understand faith, the more you will find yourself trusting God and his word, no matter what part of the process you find yourself in. Now, before I get into these things, I think I want to stop here so that I don't get into something and then I'll have to back up and try to re, uh, re-emphasize the same things. I'd rather do them next week. And so with these things said, Continue in your faith. Let God continue to build your life. And don't let anybody tell you that you don't have faith. Just build on what God has said. And so with these things said, Pastor David, thanking you for letting me speak just a little bit more in your life. And don't forget, next week, we've got more biblical truths on faith for the end times. We love you. God bless you. And we will see you then.